good evening. I believe we're going to start with a short video showing the uh, process in action. <laughs> The original concept is how do we uh, integrate or, or make better use of the Quebec-Windsor corridor. But our group quickly realized that's not the actual extent of the region, and the region is, is much more expansive than that. And we're talking Chicago to New York. All the black and red dots, these are the major airports. There, there are tremendous challenges, uh, one of the biggest being the border that runs right smack through that. So we're not just looking at you know, moving people, we're looking at moving goods, but we're also looking at moving everything by air, by rail, by truck, by water. Uh, so it's scale upon scale upon scale. We have conversations about very big things, things about governance. How do you handle uh, transportation over two provinces, over multiple states? How do you handle passing over these borders, but also projecting into the future? We don't know what's going to happen. Our giant opportunity is to be the sort of gateway for this massive region. The interesting thing is perhaps that we're trying to apply these different scenarios. So for example, what if peak oil happens and we have to change the way that we live? What if global warming continues and that New York City is flooded and suddenly all this commerce or everything has to re-divert itself to Toronto? How does that all impact transportation of people and goods along this corridor? If we can be the natural sort of hub for this region, that enhances our potential. And uh, we think we've found lots of ways through moving people that we can enhance that advantage. This was our original challenge. So the, the exercise our group was given was how will people and products move in the mega regions of the future? And this was the mega region we were assigned. So typically this is what we think our mega region is. Uh, it's the Quebec-Windsor corridor. And these are the main sort of points in that corridor. And what the video showed you, showed you the, the process where we quickly realized uh, this probably isn't the region we need to be looking at. We're, we're talking about a bigger region than this. So let's look at why we, let's step back a bit and look at why we thought this was not the region we needed to be really focused on. So here's who Ontario is exporting to. So if you look at the number one export market for Ontario, it's not Quebec, which might, most people might think would be the case, it's Michigan, substantially, substantially so. And we need to realize is that most of that trade is going across a little bridge in Windsor. So $38 billion worth of trade every year is going over this little bridge. Um, so one of the challenges for looking at sort of a scale like this is even something like the Quebec-Windsor corridor is that it's multi-jurisdictional. So it doesn't belong to anyone really. There's lots of cities, there's provinces, and you're gonna see in a second, there's different countries. So who owns this problem? Well, the reality is today, nobody really owns this problem. So a lot of these things don't get looked at. So just looking at Michigan, you have $38 billion there going over a bridge. That bridge, I would argue, is as important piece of infrastructure for the Toronto region as anything else any other group is gonna be talking about, including subways or LRTs. This is critical. So just looking at uh, auto manufacturing, you have 500,000 jobs in Ontario that are directly or indirectly dependent on the auto industry. And a lot of those jobs are in the GTA. They're not all in Windsor. So here's who we're importing from. So number one there, China. Uh, Quebec actually number three. So now let's look at where Torontonians are actually flying to today. So here are the top 10 destinations that Torontonians f flew to today. These are all direct flights from Pearson and from the Billy Bishop Airport. So number one is New York City, 71 flights today. So that's during the day, that's roughly less than every 10 minutes, there's a flight heading out from Toronto region to New York today. 
So this is why we expanded our region. So this is what we chose to look at. This is what we've called the Giga region. And here are the major cities that fall in the Giga region. So roughly, this can be defined as the Great Lakes area and the uh, north, northeast U.S. So this, this is the group. This is, sorry, the region we decided to look at. Now here's a photo. I quite like this composite photo. This is from uh, Port Architects. And this is a composite photo of, as you see on the corner there, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, Toronto, Buffalo, Montreal, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis. So these are sort of great lake cities. Now I like this photo a lot because it helps me remember that we don't live in isolation. It's quite easy for us to always think our world is sort of the GTA, but really this is our world. This, these cities are our immediate advantages and our immediate competitors. It's not just the GTA, this is the world we're looking at. So why is this important? Why do we care about this? I thought we weren't focusing on the US market anymore. I thought we were trying to be global. Well, the reason it's important to be focused on the US market is because this market here, the Giga region, is a $7.3 trillion GDP. Let's compare that. So the rest of the US, if you eliminated this, is 8.3 trillion. So what economy do you think is bigger than this on the planet? Any guesses? I heard China back there. Here's China, 5.9. So the Giga region today is 1.24 times the size of the Chinese economy. So yes, we want to focus globally and we want to find out how we do more with China, but we can't ignore the immediate giant economy that's right on our doorstep. So what's the opportunity here? Like, how does, why does this make sense? Well, it makes sense because Toronto's actually in a unique location and has unique advantages in this region. So here's a 500 mile radius map of Chicago identifying how many Americans and Canadians fall within that circle. Here's that same circle when viewed from New York. And now here's Toronto. There are actually more Americans within 500 miles of Toronto than New York. Mind you, they do have an ocean <laughs> bordering them, so a bit of a disadvantage. But substantially more than those other two spots. What other advantages does Toronto have? Well, it's actually quite well situated today as a gateway and possibly even better situated in the future if uh, climate change allows the Arctic gateways to be practical. So that would be Churchill, Manitoba and the possibility of Moosonee, Ontario, which actually is about the same distance from Toronto as Quebec City. So you can have a Pacific port closer to this market than anything exists today. So the Pacific, the Asia Pacific Gateway, Prince Rupert will talk about when we look at rail and of course the sort of NAFTA gateways and the US gateways. The other advantage Toronto has is it's amazingly diverse economy, one of the most diverse urban economies on the planet. Uh, it, has, it has critical size in, in quite a, a different set of industries, media, arts, manufacturing, technology, finance, goes on and on. So it also has the possibility of being a sectoral gateway or a cluster if it connects to these other clusters. And the reason that's important, because if it can connect sectorally and be sort of a strong representative for the region, is that it could be the input and output point for supply chains, for global supply chains into the region. Now the other interesting part that people sometimes forget is that it's also smack dab in a probably the best agricultural land in North America. And in fact, what you see there, Toronto and Chicago are two of the largest food hubs in North America, the other being Los Angeles. So substantial, a substantial food and agricultural uh, gateway possibility also. So what's the opportunity? How do we make this gateway thing practical? So we came up with what we call the Fast Track 2040 plan. And we looked at uh, four, four modes, uh, rail, uh, air, water, and of course, I can't remember now. We'll get to that when we get to that, I guess. So, road, no, it wasn't road. 
So this is a uh, freight. So what you see here is the current freight. These are key freight lines moving goods in and out of the region. What's really interesting here is that little container image on the side there. This is how long it takes to move a container of goods from Shanghai to this region. So typically that's Chicago because it's coming from the west. So if it's coming from LA, which is the largest port on the US western seaboard, it's going to take 19 days. If it's coming from Seattle, it's going to take 18 days. But if it's coming from Prince Rupert, which you might have heard of when we're talking about oil pipelines, if it's coming from Prince Rupert, it's 16 days. So it's a two to three day advantage. So not only is it faster, it also turns out that it's cheaper because the way it's graded, it's actually more sustainable to get goods from Prince Rupert. So one of the key things for us in terms of the mode, the freight mode, is how do we take advantage of that? How do we make sure that goods coming from Asia are not going from Prince Rupert to Chicago, but instead are going to Barry, Toronto, whatever. How do we create a mode there that allows us to, an intermodal mode that allows us to shift freight to road to short haul rail? So that's the opportunity that exists for freight. I just wanted to mention also that this is one of the few transportation areas where we're doing better than the Europeans because most cargo in Europe is actually by truck. Very little of it is by rail. And in North America, we actually do a lot of it by rail. So it's a real advantage for us. So the other mode we want to look at is high-speed rail. So this is actually the critical sort of transportation piece for our, our project. Nothing works without this. We need this to happen. It's, it's late, but it still, I mean, it's still necessary. So this is a map that uh, comes from America 2050 who is an independent group that's, that's sort of looking at these big picture, uh, big, big picture things in the US. So, and I've added what we'd like to see, what our group has added, what we'd like to see in Canada. So that's Montreal to uh, Detroit. Sorry, that's that BRP, sorry, sorry, Quebec City to Detroit to Windsor. So now we're gonna talk about airports. So here's a map of the flights leaving Toronto this week, and just to give you an idea of where, where they're going. So the green one, there's 2,500 2, flights are going to the Giga region out of Toronto. And that's, we're gonna talk about why that's important in a second. So let's look at modal shift air. So, our group spent a lot of time here because we thought there's a real strong connection between air and high-speed rail. So uh, Toby's talked about a, talked a bit about Pearson Airport and their challenges. Now, there, I t when, do you, when are you anticipating full capacity for that airport? 60 million passengers anywhere past 2030. So 2030. So what happens after that? Do we build more airports? Is Pickering coming on? Uh, we don't know. But that's, you know, somebody's looking at that. But there may be other opportunities. Now, it's not all about building more infrastructure, though. I'm a big fan of that. Our group wants more built. But there's also the opportunity to shift how we're using some of this transportation. So if we had a high-speed rail network in place, this blue circle here represents how far you can get from Toronto in two hours in high-speed rail. Now, two hours is a magic number because that's the point where people convert from flying to train. Anything beyond that sort of loses its advantages. So that circle is almost an entire region. So there's a real strong opportunity to move those 2,500 flights from air to train. Why is that important for the airport? Well, it's important for the airport because, as you just heard Toby said, they're going to reach their capacity in 30 years. Now you can think of an airport like a restaurant. So a restaurant is limited by the size of its kitchen and an airport is limited by the amount of runways they have, which I think you're planning to build another one, one more, but that still doesn't give them, that's, still, that's their 30 year capacity. And you can think of a restaurant's tables like an airport's uh, gates. 
So again, the airport's going to expand. They're going to build more gates, expand their terminals. So like a restaurant, <coughs> tables, the, the restaurant has two goals with its tables. Turn them over as fast as possible so you can seat more people. And try to get people to spend as much money as possible per table. So you'd rather have a big party ordering lots of entrees as opposed to one person milking a coffee. So it's the same thing for an airport, right? So it's got its gates, and it's, they're turning them over as fast as they can. But there's real value in having those gates loaded with large airplanes flying out of the gig region as opposed to smaller, airport, smaller airplanes flying within the region. There's more money in it. And in fact, the fastest growing traffic at Pearson is international flights. And I assume cargo? No? But, <laughs> but you are the largest cargo hub in, in Canada. Yeah, but that's, that's because the cargo goes in the belly of aircraft. It doesn't go up there. So the, by having high-speed rail, the airport actually, there's a possibility of being able to build out its capacity a lot longer than it thinks. And if we can eliminate a lot of these short, maybe we don't have to build that airport, or maybe we could build it out further, or maybe there are other solutions. And we need to think about this, because there are, you know, even today we have Buffalo's almost playing the role of, of a regional airport for Toronto. So it's an interesting problem. Now, this also gives us the opportunity to repurpose airports. Like, does the London airport, London, Ontario airport, need to exist if there's high-speed rail? It's an interesting question. Uh, because with high-speed rail, who are they serving? I mean, it's, it's really, or Toledo, or, or Billy Bishop even. So we have the chance to repurpose those. So the last uh, mode we looked at was water. Now, we, we struggled with this one, because it's an amazing resource here, but it's hard to figure out how to improve it. Ideally, we'd be able to dredge the St. Lawrence and have big ships come right in to the Great Lakes. But for, for a lot of reasons, cost, environmental, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, but we would love to see more, more freight being handled uh, through lake freighters as much as possible. Uh, and we also looked at possible cruise, point, cruise ports. So this is another underutilized sort of opportunity, uh, is sort of a tourism gateway uh, by having cruises run through this region. So again, I like this photo, because this is, this is one point in Canada where we decided as a nation we were going to invest in infrastructure, and it had greater goals than just moving people. It was an opportunity. And we think the same sort of situation exists today. Yes, it's about moving goods and people, but there's also a greater opportunity. And that opportunity is sort of capture an economic potential that is less likely if we don't make these investments. So, you know, we'd like to see improved border points is a big problem for anybody handling logistics, for example. And we'd like to maximize uh, our infrastructure for economic advantage. So what's the plan? Well, the plan is spend on rail, not new roads. We need to build rail. And that doesn't mean sharing existing rail lines. We need the existing rail lines for freight. We need dedicated new lines for high-speed rail. And by the way, those high-speed rail corridors can also double up as an energy corridor. If we want to finally build a national energy grid we've been talking about for a long time, that might be a good place to, to have that run through. So we also looked at uh, road pricing, and we looked at, again, the other opportunities that were there to make that happen. So what were the bold steps we identified? Uh, road moratorium, I don't think we, we need to look at highways building more highways as a solution. I don't think that's going to get us there. We need other solutions. Um, so for us, the big starting point is build the high-speed rail. Get that Montreal to Toronto high-speed rail going. And by the way, I think the Quebec-Windsor is a terrible brand. Nobody is going to be excited about investing billions of dollars in high-speed rail if your endpoints are Quebec to Windsor as if there's nothing beyond Windsor. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's called the Paris to Calais line and they ignore that it ends it. There's this channel right there, right? Call it the Montreal, Chicago high-speed rail line. Call it the Toronto, New York high-speed rail line. So people can envision what it actually means. I think Quebec, Windsor, again, is not the right brand. 
So finally, our group is trying to get us out of looking at this as just another map and visualizing it as something like this with Toronto at the center of it and the opportunity that that supplies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was excellent. Um, I think that, uh, Toby, you should uh, respond first, being from the, uh, from the airport. Um, well, I've got to say, I love it. Um, the Pearson is on record as being a very strong supporter of high-speed rail. Um, and for the very reasons that you've spoken about. Um, High-speed rail, the, the trick to high-speed rail is going to be putting um, the airports on the rail system as well. Um, and in fact, um, we started sort of blue-skying about, we're on the 401, you know, how do you repurpose stuff um, to make it work? But absolutely, um, the opportunity um, afforded by high-speed rail cannot be ignored, and you have to build that into that. what I really liked about what you guys are doing, is talking about the various different transportation modes and all working together. Um, so um, the, the one thing that people also don't quite realize is that in their weak moments, um, officials in the United States do start speaking about Canadian airports as being what they call reliever airports for congestion in the United States. And that's because um, they've reached a point of stasis on their infrastructure where they're really having a very difficult time developing. Um, Chicago has to do a reorientation of their airfield to, to maximize it. That's a $9 billion project. New York is looking for a new airport, a fourth one. Um, and as a result, what's starting to happen, Canadian airports were completely redeveloped over the course of the 1990s and the 2000s. And as a result, we have capacity that we can build on. But you're, you know, the point that you make um, about transcontinental, inter, uh, you know, uh, trans-Pacific travel um, is is absolutely critical. The the one thing that gets incredibly frustrating when you speak about this is an in, a complete lack of vision at the federal levels to match the regulatory regime that has to underpin that. Um, and it, nothing is scaled to succeed the way you've envisaged it. You know, if you've been in a lineup for security or you've been in a lineup for customs, either, either way, what you're seeing is a system that is struggling to try to manage sort of fairly minor problems in a myopic way layer on what you're talking there and, and you're gonna have an attack of the vapors by a whole bunch of regulatory agencies that we're, they're never gonna recover from. So what is critical to this is defining success here. And I think you've done a, a nice job of that, of slapping people around and say, pursue what is success, build your project to meet that success. But unfortunately, as I said, what I get very pessimistic about the myopia that we deal with on a regulatory basis. Forget just spending on high-speed rail, because you've, you've pointed out we can't get constrained by ideas of cost too much. But it's, it's you know, and I've been in so many of these meetings, it's the quiet guy at the corner of the meeting who comes from an obscure regulatory regulator who goes, yeah, but and then the whole thing crumbles away, and it's that lack of vision, it's that lack of really wanting to engage issues. So what I would ask is, I think it's a fantastic vision, I think it's absolutely right, I think it has to happen. I think pursuing not just infrastructure, but regulation is critical to making this work, because what we see constantly is projects being constrained by very short-term regulation. So, applause, that's terrific. Gordon. I too thought it was a great presentation. Uh, rail is key to a lot of things. We talked about congestion in the last presentation. Rail can have a huge impact on the congestion that goes on in our cities. Uh, companies like UPS were a massive user of rail. 
In the, UP, in the US, I believe we're the largest single purchaser of rail traffic. Uh, in Canada, everything long distance moves rail. So if it's going to Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, we're taking the little trucks back to our building, we're loading them in the trailers, putting them on the rail, and off they go. Uh, but short haul just does not work in Canada. So short haul, if, if I've got five trailers tonight that have to go to Montreal, they're all driving down the road. They're all creating pollution. We can solve a lot of, lot of woes by getting that high-speed network, making it reliable. Uh, we all know it's, it's far more sustainable moving freight on rail than it is over the road. It's better for everyone. So, you know, I, I think we have to find a way to work with government to increase our rail structures, uh, get them reliable on the short haul. Then the number of vehicles that could be taken off the road to be staggering, uh, just in my business alone. And, and think of all the other companies out there that are doing the same thing. Um, um, I thought it was, some of your statistics were very interesting. Uh, I had no idea that the Giga region was bigger than China. Everything you hear about in the news is China this, China that. Um, and, and, and yes, they're a very important trading partner. They're going to continue to grow, maybe at an exponential rate, uh, but it was interesting to know that locally, in the Giga region, it's actually bigger. Um, and, and I think a lot of times we ignore that. Um, water transportation, uh, locally, I mean, obviously international, we're one of the largest movers of containers around the world, but locally, you know, really nothing happens other than raw materials. You guys probably use use water for bringing in some of your raw materials. Um, it'd be it'd be great if we could find a way to make it commercially viable, so that we could move containers of freight from Chicago to Toronto. Who knows how many hundreds of thousands of trucks a year are are traveling that route? Uh, again, more sustainable, uh, lower emissions, could solve a lot of congestion problems. There is no viable commercial way for it to happen today. Um, if, if there was, we'd be exploring it. Uh, rail between here and Chicago is not overly viable. We'd move everything over the road to Chicago, where it gets split and sent all over the U.S. I'd love to. I'd love to load rail containers directly into the U.S. from here. The infrastructure is not there. The regulations don't work. There's a lot of things that that bear it. But uh, uh, you know, it's something where we have to move to. Yeah, and we're in, we're in the same place. We, we can't ship product to Chicago either. I mean, we can do it physically, but uh, economically, it's very difficult for us to move product from uh, Toronto to Mississauga building materials, cement uh, in particular. So we, we do use water. We do use rail. Um, for long distance distances, not short distances. Obviously, short distances are freight for us, and that is the vast majority. But we... Um, we definitely move product out to the Atlantic provinces by water. Um, we move product into the western part of the Giga region by some by rail, um, a lot by water, and then we move product to Alberta, mostly by water and then rail. Um, that's how that's how we make it work. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be fairly brief and say number one, it was quite an education for me. Well, we. We're doing work right now on the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence region to better understand it. Um, some of the statistics you put forward, um, I understood, um, but you've really crystallized it for me. I think that's, that's um, I wanna say thank you, that's very impressive. Um, so I was aware of it in, in concept, now I'm aware of it physically um, and mentally. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one word. When I, when I saw your presentation and the word is interconnectedness and interconnectedness at uh, so many levels is is um, my um, the light bulb my discovery so I would say uh, the interconnectedness between industries um, and how it affects each region I think is vitally important so are we in Toronto the value-added piece of the supply chain or are we the raw material piece of the supply chain? And how do we interconnect with the various different other regions so that we um, build ourselves as a, as a society, as a, as, a, 
as a region better. So interconnectedness around industry, interconnectedness around regulations. You talked about the, the movement of goods across the border. You talked about the bridge. Um, we do move goods across the border. We don't move goods across that particular bridge. We stop at the bridge. Um, but regulations, I think, are right now a hindrance, um, not an incentive to move products across the border. I'm sorry, I can't read without the lights. Uh, the universities and um, the expertise that the various different universities have. The Giga region is arguably the home to some of the best, if not the best, universities um, in the world. So what does that mean to us? What does that mean to the Giga region? What does it mean to Toronto as part of the Giga region? What does it mean to the, the educational institutions that we've got nearby? Um, education of the workforce. So how, how does the education of our workforce in our region differ from the other regions and how do we capitalize on that? Um, and then the concepts around unionization. What does that mean? What's that mean unionization in Toronto versus Montreal versus Chicago? And how does that affect the quality, the cost of the goods that we produce? Um, so interconnectedness is, is what I would say is, is my word coming out of your presentation. So thank you very much. Well, I, I thought it was a, a great presentation. Um, I like the fact that you questioned the premises of your original definition of the region. And when you started to look at evidence you came up with a, with a totally different definition. I, 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 it was a very uh, revealing and, and refreshing look. Um, a few quick comments. Um, one is in a different context. David Suzuki has been making the point recently that the big issues of the day are not bounded by national boundaries. And so the, the failure of 192 countries to do something significant at Copenhagen really had to do with the fact that the problems were not bounded by those national boundaries, but everybody was looking through the lens of their own boundary. And I, I think by looking at it in this different way, clearly the solutions transcend one simple national boundary. Uh, in fact, what you were talking about described differently is a bioregion with the Great Lakes at the heart and with a, a high, an underlying interconnected system of hydrology, which is really interesting. And you know, I, I, I think that's something that could be developed much further. Um, an example that occurs to me of thinking not at a, at a kind of microcosm, but the same principle as, as what you're applying. I'll give two examples. Um, I worked for a number of years in the Netherlands and the idea of the Randstad, the ring city, which links Schiphol as an airport, Rotterdam as a port, and a series of interconnected cities all linked by rail around the green ecological heart and agricultural heart of the country, takes this holistic way of thinking about all the issues where transportation is not isolated, but it's really hard, it's at the heart of a way of life which enables people to live anywhere on the Randstad. And you go from the biggest elements, Schiphol and Rotterdam, to trains, to taking a bicycle on the train, to getting on a tramway, to eventually walking when you get to your destination. In other words, you go from the aorta down through a system of veins and arteries to capillaries, and you're understanding the whole body. And I, I think that's what could be really interesting as a further development of this. Um, clearly, uh, and I, this is a final comment actually about both presentations to make a link. What's needed, you know, when we talk about the cost and the regulatory problems and all the barriers to overcome, we have to start with an explicit recognition that what we're doing now is not sustainable, period. And so, if you look at it that way, the issue is not the cost, it's the opportunity cost of not doing this. 
it's a totally different way of looking at it. And I think the way that this has to be sold to the public, whether we're talking about shared rights of way or we're talking about a whole new way of, of looking at our region, is it has to get personal. You have to explain this to people in terms of the assumptions they're making about their lives, their children's lives, their grandchildren's lives, that a lot of the things that they're assuming based on the way they live today are not going to be there for them in the future. That we're, we're on a collision course and in order to make the change, what it's costing people in time and money to move, just to stick with the, the mobility theme, it, it's just not going to work anymore and we have to make this shift. And I, I'm going to end with the elephant in the room um, and that is the cost of energy. And I think everyone is aware of Jeff Rubin former chief economist at TD Bank, who's on a second book tour, having written a really important book, Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, and his current book, The End of Growth, really talks about the profound changes that are going to occur as the cost of energy continues to rise and we get into more and more expensive petroleum. And one of the points he makes, which fits absolutely into this giga region concept, is the revival of local manufacturing and agriculture. That at some point, the shipping of goods from halfway around the world or of foodstuffs from halfway around the world becomes such that the differential in labor costs is less important than it is today. And he's predicting a revival of all of these things happening closer to home. So this. It absolutely ties into the whole revival of rail. And lastly, very I keep saying the last point. This really is the last point. Um, redundancy. I think it's extremely important not to rely on only one way of getting around from point A to B. We've seen in crises, which do occur in whatever systems we have, the need to have alternatives. And so a balanced network gives people lots of ways or multiple ways of moving goods or people is absolutely crucial. Thanks for a great presentation. So finally, and I will be brief, I, I have to say I've never been in a room where a lawyer has purported um, bigger and better regulation and people applauded. So congratulations. Less regulation. Less regulation. Less regulation. Better. Um, <coughs> Three words uh, came to mind uh, when uh, in the presentation, which was big, bold, and beautiful. And I, I really appreciate the clarity of the presentation. It was very well ex executed and uh, very provocative. And the thing that it alludes to, I don't know how many of you know uh, the Ames um, uh, publication, The Power of Ten. And that every time we change the frame within, we look at the same object, we see things from so many different uh, perspectives and um, in, in the book there's a photo of a couple on a picnic uh, in, in a park in Chicago when they zoom in times 10 times 10 to their DNA on a hand and then they zoom out zoom out and you're in the galaxy and then each time the frame changes uh, your whole understanding of what you're looking at com dramatically transforms and I think that's what um, this project I think does and what's so evocative about the project is we start to look at the same thing that we've been looking at in a completely different perspective. And it enables us to see the problem differently and the solutions differently. And, and it is of the scale, uh, you know, uh, Ken just alluded to it, uh, to um, s many of the solutions to some of our immediate problems are coming, have to come from looking at a, lar a much larger scale. So climate change. We can't actually see it when we're standing here, but we have to step back outside, you know, and see a picture of the ozone hole or see, uh, the, you know, the urban heats of uh, mapping of our cities at a much larger scale to understand that the solutions uh, we need to that problem are sitting outside of the immediate. So it's really, um, I, I think the, the combination of the two projects, very fascinating, because um, the first project, uh, Shared Spaces, really tries to take a very tactical, practical, immediate approach to immediate, uh, what's seemingly immediate problems. 
and then uh, the um, Giga region, they could very easily be happening simultaneously in terms of solutions uh, because it's, it's framing a, a kind of the broader problem. And, and if, you, if you think about things in a systems way, which we try to do a lot where, where I, at, at Metrolinks, then they're all connected. And as David Crombie says, it's the bioregion, everything's connected to everything else. So um, one of the things that I truly appreciated about the project uh, was its ability to actually uh, suspend the challenge of the immediate and try to look uh, at a scale that um, uh, probably can come up with solutions uh, that are quite different than we're used to. Um, the, um, uh, the, the other thing that um, uh, I wanted to just um, highlight is um, this, in the same notion, the movement of freight at that scale, how it inf interfaces with the movement of goods and freight at the immediate level is a big question mark for me because you know, the proposition that we invest more at the scale of the giga region in more rail so that we can move more freight off the road onto rails, um, that in principle is sound until I thought selfishly about our GO network, which is an existing corridors that we share with freight and we can't even get enough passengers moving and if they tried, if we try to move more freight, there, there, there is no space or time, uh, and, and it would be a big challenge. So, the how these two scales meet together um, is is the next evolution of the question of the two projects. And so, uh, I love the pairing of the two because I think they pro they make propositions that are equally valid, but at the same time, really different to reconcile. <laughs>